This is Lester Smith reporting. Next news as it happens. Next scheduled news at 11 o'clock over WOR Radio 710, the talk of New York. And here's Gene Shepard. going to say, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's called uh, being a yay sayer. And, uh, you know, it's a philosophical stance. You walk around and holler yay. You know what a yay sayer is, you know. It's a, that's a, as opposed to a nay sayer, which point you walk around naying. But, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, however, uh, today, uh, since it is summertime, we must, uh, or beginning, it's almost, you know, we have to salute, uh, we just really have to salute the beginnings of summer madness. You know, it's kind of a tradition uh, here on this little uh, thingy we do uh, to uh, celebrate the effect that the changing seasons have upon the human organism. Now, you like to think you're the same person year in and year out, but you you really aren't, you know. (laughs) I mean, let's face it. Oh, no, no. When you're walking around in the middle of a sleet storm in November and uh, you're kicking a frozen cigar butts out of your way on 6th Avenue, uh, you know, you look up at the leaden skies of Manhattan and the cabs have got their permanent off-duty sign on. Uh, as you know, the permanent off-duty sign goes on November 1st. And uh, so, you know, you, you begin to have a different view of life. Now, here it is, spring, naturally. And so now you're looking at the leaden skies of Manhattan. But they're hot leaden skies. So, it's you know, hot lead is different from cold lead. And, 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 uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, just a whole different ball game. So tonight, we'd like to take this opportunity to put down here on a record so a thousand years from now when they play these tapes they'll know what kind of stuff we really did as opposed to the stuff that you see in the history books you know the real thing uh, or as uh, Merle Haggard would say the real thing uh, we'd like to get it down right you know right where it counts and what I'd like to uh, first of all salute a recent celebration which was held at Chase Stadium that's been the home of much madness uh, over the years it's a uh, it's uh, our version of the uh, Roman Colosseum, where uh, all kinds of ideologies clash. Good guys fight bad guys at all times. Uh, occasionally, a relief pitcher will be fed to the lions, and uh, the lions uh, take <laughs> take nice and solid aim. <laughs> uh, did you see the relief pitcher that came in the other day? Uh, well, it doesn't matter his name. He's a relief pitcher. It's a generic crowd, and the, the relief pitcher came because you realize that among all the athletes. Uh, relief pitchers generally are the most moody. Uh, they're like, uh, psychiatrists. A psychiatrist is a moody person too, because he sees nothing but trouble all day long in his work. I mean, nobody ever comes down and, to, to the, to the analyst, you know, and lays on the couch and says, Doc, I come here because it just feels great. I feel fantastic. 
I mean, I'm just, everything is cool. I mean, everything. I can't believe it. At which point, of course, the analyst would have to start analyzing him for obviously uh, a distorted view of life. Uh, so, so naturally, uh, a relief pitcher has much the same problems. No relief pitcher is ever called in because things are going good. They, 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 uh, you know, the manager does not, uh, sit there on the bench and as he sees the club is now seven runs ahead and, uh, the pitcher is really laying him in there. You know, he's got his fastball is smoke. He's snapping off that curveball. He doesn't say, hey, it's time to bring in Gus. Uh, let's get rid of Jake here and bring in Gus because Gus never sees this kind of a situation. You know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what a relief pitcher would think if he's brought in. You know, when when everything is under control, no way. See, so what happens, of course, is that the big hero, usually some big guy, you know, the Seavers of the world or somebody like that, uh, the, the the Nolan Ryans of the world, when all of a sudden their fastball starts punching holes in the screen over the upper deck instead of you know, instead of going where they should go, he starts, you know, he loses his control. The other day, I see uh, Nolan Ryan, you know, he's pitching away, and all of a sudden his control went, just went, just like that. And that is, that is enough to send any batter into, uh, into almost a catatonic fit when Roland, Nolan Ryan loses his control. I mean, that's like a, all of a sudden a strange monkey appears in your neighborhood or a gorilla with a loaded 12-gauge shotgun. I mean, you tend to get nervous. And so, so that's exactly <laughs> with the safety off. And that's what happened with Norman Ryan. He's, he's throwing that fastball, see, and Ryan started to press. Instead of, uh, you know, instead of saying, now wait a minute here, and I'm going to throw, lob him in underhand for a while until I get my control back, he starts to throw him even harder, which is what a fastball pitcher occasionally does when his control is going. He starts really working. And one, the first one he threw, you see, after his control was gone, it it bounced right at the feet of the hitter, but it didn't actually bounce. It was like a it was like a roughly like a 105 shell hitting there. See, it went boom, boom, and dust flew up, and the hitter flew up in the air. See, oh my God! And he comes back down. His helmet is jiggling. See, and he he gets into the batter's box, and I noticed he was standing back, roughly oh a third of the way now back towards the uh, well. He was back almost towards the uh, uh, to the to the back line. See, he was moving back. And then the next pitch was about a foot and a half over his head, see? And the catcher leaps up and grabs him as he did. It was such a hard ball that it knocked the catcher's glove right off. And it was like, whap! And then he, at that point, the, the batter now, <laughs> the batter is batting roughly 10 feet outside of the dugout. He has moved back, back of the on deck circle. And uh, he's just waiting to see what's going to happen there, see? So when they call in the relief pitcher, and he comes from, from the, uh, from the bullpen way out there, see, and they have this silly little cart they bring him in, in, you know, this little cart that looks like a baseball hat. Must be embarrassing to ride around with a silly little cart that's got a bill on it. It's got a bird painted on the top, you know, and he, he comes, <laughs> he comes in. <laughs> And of course, people are throwing pop bottles. Shea, you know, they're throwing they're throwing paper cups and stuff at him. And he gets out of his uh, little cart and he runs across the third baseline. His head's down, and you could just see there was no cheers, you know. And then they they came on and they announced the relief pitcher's name. See, and uh, you've you've heard the uh, PA system at Shea, right? Well, it comes out something like this. Uh, give me a little, just a, ah, uh, touch it, please. Ah, uh, touch it, please. No, ah, uh, pitch it, please. No, pitching for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ah, uh, number 16. Ah, uh, number 16, lost it for a while. No way to tell who the hell he is. His name, you couldn't understand his name. Uh, so after all, he's not, uh, Nolan Ryan, but at least once in a while he'd like to have his name announced clearly over the PA system. It sounded like the PA announcer was clearing his throat twice, uh, and that was his name. <laughs> and what's worse, it wasn't even number 16, it was number 48. He gave him the wrong number on top of it, so if you were looking it up in the scorebook, you didn't get the right guy. Actually, you got a retired coach. Uh, somehow, strangely, he was out there pitching, you know, some guy that retired in 1948. And uh, is playing out the string, see. So here's the relief pitcher. He walks out there, see, and he kicks the dirt a little bit. And uh, he looks around. Of course, the roof has fallen in. Uh, you know, he's so used to seeing the bases loaded 
that uh, the, I guess most relief pitchers would be a little confused if they looked around and they only saw the first baseman over there. You know, they'd say the whole time, there's uh, uh, not enough guys on the field here, something's wrong. So he looks around, see, and the bases are loaded with these guys. <laughs> Hopping up and down. There's a guy on third base, you know, who, who broke the three-second mile last year, you know. So here he is down there, and he's got a catcher, you see. The worst part of it is the catcher who's been catching has just returned from an injury. So he doesn't have an arm anymore now. So it's all alone out there, <laughs> the relief pitcher. So he, he looks down there, and, and uh, he... he uh, shakes his head, shakes off a couple of signs. At that point, he goes into his windup, and he proceeds to strike out the next three batters, at which point Nolan Ryan gets credit for the victory, and the relief pitcher gets back in his little cart with the hat on it with the bird. <laughs> Nobody knew who he was. <laughs> and so if you think that you're laboring away in anonymity, friend, I can only tell you that nothing's worse than to find yourself laboring in anonymity before 42,000 people. That is really a rubbing the salt, see. So anyway, we'd like to salute. If I, this is not a game about baseball, although it could very well be. Uh, I, I would. Uh, ha, has it occurred to you that many an outfielder, if uh, if the uh, relief pitcher uh, has the general outlook of a psychiatrist for the same reason, uh, you must understand that a third baseman uh, has the general outlook on life as a, one of the more active members of SWAT. Uh, the, uh, because uh, when you're playing third base, there's, a, there's only two kinds of third basemen. The guys with a, with a false upper plate and the guys that are going to get it next season. So, <laughs> I mean, so yeah, well, oh yes, many a ball has been caught by your upper, your, your, by your upper teeth. If not, you know, it glances resoundingly off and the shortstop makes a beautiful play and gets cheered, but nobody says anything about the teeth you see all around third base, which, by the way, actually has happened. I mean, more than one guy has slid into third base. And as he slides past the bag you know, and grabs it after a triple, he sees, digging up out of the ground, he sees old old teeth and pieces of jawbone, you know, from old games, <laughs> in case you're interested. It's a tough game out there. It really is. Have you noticed, though, there's a... I wish somebody... How about everybody here getting behind us, all you sport fans? Why in the world does Kurt Gowdy keep referring to ball players as youngsters? He, he, he keeps saying, y'all, that youngster shows plenty of promise. Here's this guy standing up to the plate, the youngster he's talking about, say, been in the minors for eight years. And, uh, yeah, he's got blue jowls and he's got these mean eyes of a guy who's, uh, you know, ridden buses <laughs> all over the country. And he's now, you know, about pushing 30. Uh, and somehow there's something about baseball announcers that continually makes them refer to ball players as youngsters. Yeah, even a rookie, a rookie is not a youngster in baseball. Not if he's made the big time. He ain't no youngster. Now, uh, I don't know why this is. I've never heard a football player referred to as a youngster. Can you imagine Rosie Greer joins the Giants and, uh, <laughs> and Mel, Mel Allen, who was doing the games in those days, or Marv Alpert or somebody says, Oh, there's a promising youngster comes out of the line now. Oh, come on. But they, they don't do that to football players. And it seems to me that the players union ought to get together and say, This is humiliating. I'm not a youngster. I'm a major league ball player, a, a grown up man with three kids. But Kurt Dowdy does that. Uh, I, you never hear of uh, basketball players referred to as youngsters. You know, can you imagine uh, calling uh, Jabbar a youngster? This is WOR in New York, right? And uh, before we go any further, please, if you will, James, one of those money. If they the tell game. you not to buy a car because the times are tough. Da, 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 if they say you'll never find a deal and you'll find good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they say a new car costs oh, too I love much, it. they <laughs> say <laughs> just <laughs> Dodge, 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 Dodge,
Oh, that was real good. Well, that's yeah, so exciting. Uh, which high-potency vitamin do physicians and pharmacists recommend most? Well, uh, according to this copy here, this is not a personal statement, Theragran. Uh, with minerals by Squibbly, no, Squib. The name Squib on the label means you have no doubt about the honor and integrity of the maker. And right now you can take advantage of their special offer. You get 30 free when you buy 100. That's a month's supply for one person, but the supply is limited. So get your Theragrand by Squib now. And that's an italic, so that must be important now. Check your Squib vitamin headquarters at your local pharmacy, huh? Okay, your local vitamin pusher. Now, do you have uh, another one there for us? Right. If you had a chance to build a substantial retirement estate and realize major tax advantages, wouldn't you welcome some expert help with the initial planning? Here's important news from the East New York Savings Bank. The new individual retirement account is now available to wage earners not covered by pension plans. And East New York has set up a special advisory service to help you take full advantage of this opportunity. You'll learn which savings account is most beneficial for IRA deposits. You'll better understand the key tax provisions. You'll find out how to arrange the most advantageous withdrawal of your IRA funds. Contact our Pension Specialist Service. Call area code 212-354-0508. That's 212-354-0508. An East New York representative will arrange a free personal planning session at the most convenient office. That's the individual approach to the individual retirement account. The East New York Savings Bank, member FDIC. If you're looking for fun, come on in. Don't 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 try me. Oh, it's such a cute little thing. Try me like you've never been flown before. Oh, fly Jennifer's Day Coach Excursion Fair to Miami and save a big 25% off the regular round-trip fare. So now it's only $141 round-trip to Miami, even on a luxury 747 Fly Jennifer Fly National. Fly me! It says, uh, it says read fast at the end. Well, you know, I take direction really well. Hey, uh, we have a... Uh, as you probably know, there's been a... I have had a long relationship with cockroaches... And I, I have to go on record as saying that the following commercial does not necessarily reflect the uh, the uh, editorial opinion of the speaker here because I'm pro cockroach, as you probably know. But uh, as uh, you also, pro this is the commercial now. You probably know about blackjack ant and roach killer. Uh, if there are any cockroaches listening tonight, I'm sorry, gang. The outstanding household insecticide in the black and red aerosol can. It's murder on resistant strains of roaches and other crawling insects. Uh, if you have a, <laughs> a member of your family that's a crawling insect, well, the same chemists who continually test and reformulate blackjack for maximum effectiveness have created the most powerful most pleasant to use aerosol for flying insects your hard pressed dollar can buy. It's called Black Jack Household Fly and Mosquito Spray, and it's found in a light blue aerosol can bearing the familiar Black Jack trademark. <laughs> Black Jack Household Fly and Mosquito Spray is deadly to all flying insects, but has no harsh or irritating odor. In fact, it's mild and pleasant. It's faintly reminiscent of freshly ground cinnamon. Well, I don't like that. You know, when I was in the Army, <laughs> let's let annoying mosquitoes or other flying insects bug you this summer. Let's let them know who's boss, right? Use blackjack, household fly, and mosquito spray. Okay, it's by the Safeguard Chemical Corporation, manufactures more than 40,000 outstanding household products. You know, I'll tell you, that's, that's, uh, uh, now that can fool you, you know, it says like ground cinnamon. Well, now, I don't know whether you were ever in the Army but or any of the armed forces, but uh, what you do, you see, when you're in the armed forces, among other things that uh, you don't see written up much in, uh, you know, novels about the Army, you go through what they call gas indoctrination. You, they train you, you know, to, to, to know about gas. And uh, among other things, uh, uh, of course, you have to smell these various gases so you can identify them. <laughs> and uh, I remember, you know, just so clearly, because it's the first time in your life you're told things like that. I mean, uh, people don't just come up ordinarily in your life and tell you, uh, you know, I like you guys, every one of you, be, beware of anything that smells like rose petals. 
Well, now, you know, a lot of perfume smells like rose petals, and, you know, you go out with this girl, and, and you, you don't want to think she's giving you the old, uh, you know, the old gas treatment. But uh, this uh, sergeant is walking around up there, and he says, Now, all right, you guys, this is Gas Orientation and Indoctrination Course number 117D uh, for basic infantry trainees. Now, you're going to have to pass this. If you don't pass it, you'll have to take the course over again, so it's no use goofing off and saying you don't like it. Because if you flunk on a test in the end, not only are you going to get gassed, but you're also going to flunk, and you're going to have to stay here another, another 90 days in this hellhole. As you all know, this is a hellhole. You want to stay another 90 days, you just flunk this course. Right? Now, we call that motivation. And uh, so I think a lot of you are motivated to get out because you've only been here a week and already you hate it. Right, all right. Okay, here we go now. Now, the first gas we're going to talk about here is what we call phosgene. That is a gas called phosgene, and uh, it causes uh, almost instantaneous pip. You you breathe any of that phosgene, and you wish you hadn't, buddy. A little of that phosgene, your eyeballs are going to pop out. There's going to be problems with your ears. are going to ring. You're going to fall heavily to the ground. You're going to break out in a rash. You will not be able to uh, eat, sleep, or breathe, and it will seriously affect your sex life on top of that. That's also called motivation. So you don't want to get none of that phosgene gas. Now, if you want to know what phosgene gas smells like, it smells like apples. Apples. You all eat apple? Any of you guys never had no apples? Okay, everybody in this crowd has had an apple sometime, one time or another in his life. Well, phosgene smells like fresh apples. And uh, now I will show you what that smells like. I have a, a spray can here where I will smell some. I will spray some of this room. You can smell the apples and... When you smell that, you will know then that that is phosgene gas. All right now, Corporal, will you please spray it in the back of the room there and uh, let the men stay here and know what the phosgene gas smells like. Well, of course, we're all sitting there, you know, wearing our, our helmets and our sweaty fatigues, and uh, they start spraying a room with this stuff, see? And it smells great, you know, it, it, it does. It smells a little bit like, uh, you know, an elegant aftershave lotion. And it does. It really smells good. So he says, all right, guys, I want you to sniff that, because that's not real phosgene we're blowing into this room. However, if you do smell any of that when you're out on your final gas bivouac test, that will be the real thing, and you better get that gas mask on fast. You will be trained in the use, and in the donning of, that means uh, putting it on, for those of you who don't know, you will be trained in the use and the donning of the M7 gas mask with chemical filter. And you will not, I repeat, not take that chemical filter and throw in the weeds like a lot of guys do. Because if you do, you'll have to get gas right out of your skull. All right, now, here we go now. The next one we will show you will be how mustard gas smells. Now, the first thing you say to yourself is, mustard gas must smell like mustard. You are wrong. I repeat, R-O-N-G, wrong. It does not smell like mustard, because if it did smell like mustard, that would be too damn silly and too easy to detect, right? So it does not smell like mustard. This smells a little bit like what we call hollyhocks. Now, many of you never smell no hollyhocks, right? Well, I never smelled none until I come in the Army here. I mean, I mean uh, what kind of a type do you think I am? Going around smelling flowers, huh? I'm not one of them guys. Ah, ah. Anybody here want to try me out? Or I'll knock your face in. Okay. Now, here's what a hollyhock smells like. Corporal, squirt the hollyhock, please. Well, then they squirt the hollyhock. You never heard this kind of a lecture, did you? Well, this is exactly the way it went. <laughs> so they, they, after, you know, he finishes with the hollyhock. Well, you can't tell what a hollyhock smells like because they discovered in the Army the hollyhock has no known smell, even in spite of the fact they sprayed it in there. See, so we're getting a little worried. He sprays it all around, you know, and it, it kind of smells just like, you know, like Jersey air or something. It doesn't smell like anything. He says, all right, all right, you'll have, you will be given a test on it if you cannot identify the smell of hollyhocks. You will flunk this test because you've got to get 100% to graduate out of the gas orientation and indoctrination course, which has been taught by me since, uh, well, since the very first crowd come through here. So if you think you put anything on, I heard them all, boy. I heard every last excuse. You're going to learn it. Right. Okay, now the next gas is what we call. This is a gas which is a, an irritant, an eye irritant gas, which is known by the public, really, as, uh, as tear gas. Now, we have a stronger one in the Army. It more, does more than tear it and rots your eyeballs right out. So uh, when this stuff's come blowing at you, you better get down get that gas mask on fast. Is it, a, it is also a contact gas. You won't have to wear your gloves. 
So, uh, all right, uh, now how, what does this one smell like? I'm going to, I'm going to blow this one into the room without telling you, and you identify what it smells like. All right, uh, uh, corporal, please, uh, blow the, uh, tear gas in the back there so they can tell what it smells like. I want you to smell this, and give me the first guy that raises his hand and tells me what it smells like. We'll get a three-day pass if he's right. Uh, that's motivation. We call it motivation in the Army. Okay, here we go now. Corporal, spray the back there with the mystery gas. He's walking around spraying it, see? I, I couldn't believe it. It smelled like gasser. Who was my my buddy? It also smelled a little like Zinsmeister. Who was also... <laughs> you know, I couldn't figure it out. I, I, I can't, you know. So I, I, I wanted to raise my hand and say, Hey, it smells like Zinsmeister after a 20-mile hike. It does smell just like him. And I, I, I figured I'd better not, see? So a couple of guys put their hands up. One guy puts his hands up, and a sergeant says, All right, what is it, soldier? What does it smell like? The guy says, uh, It smells like a Hershey bar. He says, Wrong! It does not smell like a Hershey bar. That does not it smell like a Hershey bar. You're trying to be funny? Now sit down, soldier. Don't go wising off in this class. I, I heard that one before. All right, anybody else here? Another guy gets up and says, It smells to me like, uh, Sergeant, uh, uh, it smells like a taffy apple. Oh, you yeah, stupid. Stupid. Oh, you are stupid. Now, all right, now, I'll tell you what it smells like. It smells like an alamite grease gun. We sat there stunned. None of us had smelled an alamite grease gun recently. <laughs> all right. Write down on our your notebooks, alamite grease gun. After that, write tear gas. Now, we are going to give you a test on this later, which you must pass. Well, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. So I'm just warning all of you cockroaches out there, if you smell any freshly ground cinnamon in your neighborhood, I think you better move out awful fast. And don't think that somebody's laying out some nice uh, some nice coffee cake for you. And by the way, have you seen that commercial? One of the most irritating commercials recently is the guy that keeps referring to a coffee cake as streusel. That is not streusel. That's like calling pizza pizza. <laughs> well, you know, how about a nice little pizza pie, huh? I said, oh, silly, you wouldn't do that, huh? You would not. Uh, I doubt it very much. Uh, or uh, that's like going in and ordering some lasagna. It is streusel, streusel, not streusel. It is streusel. I repeat, class, that is streusel coffee cake. Now, you may not like it, but that's the way it is, and that's the word, and that's what it means. <laughs> Would you please uh, uh, give me give me a little of that uh, jovial music there to get them back? That's it. That's it. That's good. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's what we wanted. I want to cheer. After all, this is an educational program. You're learning something here. All right, men. Now sing. My God, we're going to sing this outfit for morale's sake alone. That's called morality in the army. I want to hear a lot of singing and dancing here. And the first guy that don't get up on the tables and dance in his company party is not going to get no three-day pass next month, and I'm going to see to it, right? And he's going to get a lot of details he didn't even know they did here in the Army.
thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. That's very nice. Yeah, I sure can play that thing. You got to admit it. You know what? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a grudgingly. Even Jim has to admit it. He hates like hell to admit anything. But uh, nevertheless, I would like to <laughs> get, 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 prepare it in there, Jim. We're going to do that thing now. I said I was going to do right. How much time we got? Oh, we got plenty of time. I would like to salute the first example of true madness to uh, break out in the summertime. I would like to salute the, uh, there it is. I have the clipping here. I don't have to have the clipping. I actually saw it. Did you see it on television? It was just fantastic. When the Out of Chase Stadium, when the Army uh, marked its 200th anniversary, leave it to the Army. It did it. Marked its 200th anniversary at Shea with a brief ceremony. Before the, uh, it was actually before the Angel Yankee game. You see that? And, uh, <laughs> well, uh, what they had, they had, they had a couple of these 75 millimeters set up there. It's a very, you know, very powerful little cannon, see? The French 75 is a, is a infamous weapon and, uh, contributed mightily to the discomfort of the German army at several points in its history. And, uh, so the French 75 did not let us down. Uh, they had a couple of French 75s out there, and they said, on the PA system beforehand, uh, would you please give me a little echo chamber? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Army is now celebrating its 200th anniversary. And the 714th slash 23rd, 1962nd, uh, signal, air warning, multiple dipole, 75 millimeter cannon team is here today to give us a demonstration of the 75 millimeter cannon. Uh, this cannon uh, is one of the uh, weapons that the Army has used historically throughout its 200 years, and they are going to fire two 75 millimeter cannons this afternoon to give us a little salute and a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the U.S. Army here in America. Let's give them a big hand. Give me a little cheer there, please. Let's give the Army a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, would you please be prepared to give us another cheer in just a moment, because the Army will now prepare to fire its 75 millimeter cannons to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the U.S. Army. And now they are preparing to fire. You will notice that these Army men work as a well-oiled team. And they are firing blank cartridges, which have been especially prepared by the U.S. Army to give you an accurate idea of what the 75 millimeter cannon sounds like without all the rest of it. All right, here we go. They are now preparing to fire. Here is the countdown. One, two, they will fire at the count of five. Three, four. Five. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, there's been a little problem here. Uh, you will notice that a large portion of the center field wall has been blown out, and uh, a large portion of the scoreboard. Luckily, no one was sitting in that area. And uh, thank you very much. That is the demonstration. No, wasn't that nice? I mean, that's just exactly... <laughs> so in case you didn't see it, that's the way it went. It was really great. I thought I did that quite well. Uh, but uh, what they did, they just simply blew a hole in the center field. Whoa, wow, the big hole flies out. And it caused a little excitement there. They almost got the bullpen, you know, and that would have been just another shot in the head for a left-hander who's been used to having... <laughs> You should have seen the ball players. They were all standing around with their mouths hanging open when they saw the chunk fly out of the wall. Well, of course, that's the blank shot. You ought to see when they used the real one. The Bronx would have disappeared. Or, you know, at least flushing. You know, It would have plowed a hole all the way out to Montauk, right through, <laughs> right through flushing. But uh, you, you, you see this kind of stuff uh, in the summertime. That's why I like the summer. I mean, like uh, last year, the Phillies had... Uh, had this guy that uh, was going to fly on a kite. Do you see that one? He, he he came down a chute. I mean, what happened? He got an updraft or a downdraft. He stalled out, and 
<laughs> you would appreciate this as a flyer, Jim. He stalled out. What it was was, a, was an accelerated stall. And that's the worst kind. See, he was going full bore down the chute, and uh, he, he, he just had a little miscalculation that there was a little wind coming in over the top of the stadium and all, and he, cl he climbed too rapidly. Next thing you know, he went down, and he just went right through the box seats. About 35 people sitting there, their hot dogs are flying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I kind of like that one. That was, that was a, you know, an example of the summer madness, which I appreciate. Uh, you know, speaking of, uh, of demonstrations of that kind, uh, uh, you know, great demonstrations that, uh, that people do. I, I remember one time I was sitting in a ballpark and, uh, it was, a, you know, they were going to give a, going to give a great big, uh, great big award. It was, uh, it was the day for some ball player. Uh, would you please give me a little echo chamber? I'll show you what it sounded like. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, our beloved third baseman here at the Chicago White Sox, it is today we're going to honor him. It is Tony Pyatt Day here at the Chicago White Sox. And Tony Pyatt's fans have come from all over the Chicago area to give him uh, little gifts and all sorts of things which he can carry forward forever as part of Tony Pyatt Day. Uh, Tony Pyatt, as you know, is the first Chicago White Sox third baseman to have a lifetime average of over 185 points in the American League. Tony Pyatt right now is batting 192, and uh, he's having a great year. Tony Pyatt has hit two home runs this year, and all of you know that he is leading the Chicago White Sox in three doubles. He has had three doubles in the major league ball teams that they have faced this year, not including exhibition games. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the automobile that will be presented to Tony Pyatt by the fans of Tony Pyatt. It is now coming out of the center field stands. Let's give a big cheer for Tony Pyatt's new automobile. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now, Tony Pyatt... Uh, standing at third base, uh, the automobile will be driven around the infield so that all of you can see it, and Tony Pyatt will take the keys, and it will be the number one gift on today's Tony Pyatt Day. Tony, do you have anything to say to your fans? Thank you very much, you very much. Thank you very much, folks. It's the greatest day of my life. Thank you very much, Tony Pyatt. Tony Pyatt just thanks his fans for the beautiful automobile, the new, brand new car, which is being driven out. And the car comes out through the center field, and it drives around, and all the people are cheering. And uh, all of a sudden, the car stopped back at second base. It didn't get to third base. It stopped. <laughs> and then thousands of people are watching. And suddenly, without any warning, from underneath the car, this great big cloud of white steam comes. The car is overheated, unbelievable, and the steam is coming out, and the driver jumps out of the car, he opens the hood, <laughs> the steam flies, and Tony Pyatt is standing there, that's so typical of Tony Pyatt's career with the White Sox. On his day, Tony Pyatt, they are giving him a car before he even gets it. The damn thing is overheated, it's blowing steam all over the ballpark, and <laughs> the crowd is Jared, and Tony... Tony stands over there and he goes over, you know, he walks over and they give him the keys. He gives a little speech. And then seven groundskeepers came out and pushed the car off the field because they couldn't get it started. <laughs> At that point, there was a big cheer. Let's hear that cheer. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. Now, I was a kid, you know, and I was present at that terrible fiasco. You know, it was really bad news. Like the time I was in this class, you know. How many, how many times have you been in a situation where uh, it was supposed to be a gala situation and everybody prepared for this thing and it turns out to be uh, not only not gala, but curiously, uh, let's say, grim? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you one one that I remember specifically. I was in uh, I was in uh, in college. This was this is a thing that happened in school, and uh, and you know you don't have much money when you're in in college, no way. And uh, you know you're scraping along there. And I had a I had a job uh, after school where I worked down at this this bowling alley. They had a, a student bowling alley in the in the student. Uh, uh, recreational center, you know, and I was making a cool 12 cents an hour, and 
And uh, so one day, uh, late late in the in the semester, now we had had this guy for two semesters, and he was a math teacher, and everybody really liked this guy. So he was a, he was a little short, round guy that smoked cigars. And uh, he was really great. Uh, you know, most math teachers tend to be uh, not the most funny people in the world. For some reason or other, math is uh, kind of a religious thing with me. <laughs> and, and, uh, but he was not like that, see. And more than that, he was good, a really good teacher because a lot of us had had a, a real rotten time with math before we got to this guy. You know, math is like a foreign language in some ways. That uh, it, it really is. Uh, that, that, that if you get the right teacher, math is really easy. To most people, uh, but if you have had teachers that have not done it really right, uh, it, it can be forever a mystery, a total, complete, and you know, utter mystery. But this guy had suddenly opened everybody up. See, we were all really grateful because a lot of us had gotten into this math class, uh, to put it mildly, with trepidations. <laughs> I mean, and as a matter of fact, since it was a requirement, you had to take it. A lot of guys were figuring, you know, this is going to be my Armageddon. I'm, I'm never even going to get through school because of this thing. And here it was, it was a, maybe a week or so before the end of the semester, and we were all obviously going to pass. We really did it, see. So everybody felt great. So we're sitting down in the cafeteria one day, and this kid comes around from the class, and he says, listen, he said, we're going to have it. We're going to give a gift to Mr. Lefkowitz, see. We're going to give a gift to him, see. His name was Chester Lefkowitz. We're going to give a gift to Chet. And uh, he's been really so great to all of us. You know, he's helped us all. So what we're going to do is give him a gift. And uh, you're just going to have to pony up, buddy, and it's not going to be a cheapie. We're going to have a good gift, right? Now, there's 30 of us in the class, and we're, we've decided that what we're going to do is give a minimum of $4 per each. Now, pony up, right? Andy up. Let's see it. And so each one of us gives us $4. You know, this is like my whole whole pay from the bowling alley for the week, see? So, but anyway, I felt so gratified to chat. See, I was glad to give it. So the committee, there's always a committee. The committee decided that what they were going to do was to get him this great watch. It was going to cost 120 bucks, and we were getting a knockdown on it on top of it. It would go for like 160 bucks, see. So we're going to get him this great wrist watch. And, uh, and it was going to be engraved, you know, to Mr. Lefkowitz from a class 207D with gratitude and admiration for a great teacher and a great guy signed the entire class that passed. So, uh, <laughs> We, we went out, and uh, they bought this watch. It was really beautiful, see, so, and it was all beautifully engraved. And uh, with that, uh, um, you know, the back was all engraved, and it had a gold case, and it was just a really great-looking watch. And so everybody took a look at it. They they passed it around to all of us, and uh, we were all looking at it, and everybody said, oh, boy, that's really beautiful. Where did he get this, see? Sure enough, and uh, by the way, the committee was getting this for him because the head of the committee, see, uh, said uh, to all of us that uh, he had noticed that Mr. Lefkowitz did not have a wristwatch. And he said, and uh, since uh, we know that he doesn't have one, we've watched all semester, he does not have one, so that's the obvious gift to get him. So we did. And it was ingrained. Well, came the big day. It was a nice day, you know, and everybody had gotten his grades. And uh, Mr. Lefkowitz is standing up there at the class, and up goes the committee and says, Mr. Lefkowitz, we don't want to embarrass you. Uh, but, uh, you know, the class got together, and we bought you this great wristwatch, and we all you know, you contributed to it, and it's really just a little token of what we think of the wonderful teaching that you've given us this year. Mr. Lefkowitz looks around, he says, gee, uh, I'm really pleased. Uh, you know, it's it's really not the right thing to do, because after all, my job is to teach you, you know, and the school may not like this, but uh, since you... And he opens this up, see, it's a beautiful wristwatch. And he looks at it. And he says, oh, I was afraid of that. You know, I was, I just know how to tell you, gang, but uh, I was afraid that you had it engraved. And the class says, yeah, we wanted our names. We want your name. You have everything in there. He says, well, you see, if it wasn't engraved, we could take it back. He said, because, you see, I, I'm allergic to metal. And I can't wear any kind of metal next to my skin. I break out in an unbelievable rash. And if metal gets anywhere near me, I, I uh, fall down in a fainting fit. So I cannot wear any wristwatch. You probably notice I don't have a wristwatch. Well, that's the reason why. Uh, I cannot accept this wristwatch. On the other hand, you know, you can't take it back. But uh, thanks anyway, gang. <laughs> it's a real nice gesture. It really is. We all sort of sat around, you know. <laughs> we never mentioned it after that, you know. <laughs> this is W.O.R. New York. You stay tuned for In Conversation.